Kia ora whanau. welcome to our first webinar for 2022 with ECU Learning Unlimited. My name's Angela Bush and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. And it is an even greater pleasure for me to introduce to you our presenter and speaker tonight, Marilyn Fleer from Monash University in New South Wales, Australia. Kia ora, welcome Marilyn. Thanks, Angela, and um, thank you everyone for joining the, this free webinar. Um, I'm delighted to be here to have this opportunity to um, share with you some of the things we've been doing. And um, I'm going to put the share screen on um, now. Um, oops, let me just a minute. I've, I just need to make sure it's all open. Okay, oopsie. Uh, I haven't lost anyone yet. No, good. <laughs> um, Okay, I had it all open before. Let me just make sure it's all working. And share screen, and here we go. Good. So I'm um, zooming in from Bunurong um, country, and uh, which is um, located, um, of course, in Australia. So I have some iconic images uh, for you to enjoy. Um, and, um, and the presentation today explores conceptual play worlds. So I hope this will be of great interest to you. Um, I understand from Angela that um, New Zealand hasn't had too many um, um, STEM-related um, webinars um, or workshops um, in relation to, um, to this area. And um, so I'm hoping um, that today what we can cover is... Um, uh, in relation to what does a conceptual play world look like in practice. And you've all been working hard today, so um, I'm hoping that the visual images that I share with you, a nice overview video to share with you to, to, uh, to kickstart the session, uh, followed by then looking at um, the, pl the planning characteristics of a conceptual play world. So I'll step you through the five of those, for those of you who'd like to take away the ideas and give it a go. And uh, also then I want to share with you some more video clips um, in relation to um, what the practices look like for infants and toddlers, particularly because I'm very passionate about this area. And, um, and I believe uh, that it's such an important area, but it hasn't received the research attention it rightly deserves. And it doesn't have the resources to support it as other areas in early childhood have. So it is, it is kind of like the Cinderella phenomenon um, of the poor cousin, but going to rise from the ashes and dominate the world, I'm sure. But anyway, um, now, and then at the very end, I'm going to share with you some free resources that we have. And that's why today's session is free as well, is because I work for the Australian, uh, doing research for the Australian Research Council. And um, and the everything I do is for free because of that. So it's five years of research um, that we're undertaking in early childhood, specifically in play-based settings uh, for the area of STEM. So let's launch into uh, the first part. What does a conceptual play world look like in practice? So I'm going to share this video with you. And this is an amazing teacher, Belinda. Um, and you'll see a little map of Australia and where she's from uh, in a country town. Um, and I visited her at the beginning of our uh, research uh, to share with her um, conceptual play worlds. And, um, and so she's sharing with you what that looks like as a quick overview. It's only um, a short, um, just shy of one minute. Children had a wonderful experience in this amazing play world. You could see the kids so incredibly engaged and then those learning outcomes are going to be coming in all directions. Marilyn came to our school and with my class of pre-primaries, she created a play world and demonstrated that through the story of Rosie's Walk. Rosie went for a walk. As soon as we entered the play world, we were all in our characters. Group of bees. You're the queen bee. I'm the queen bee. Oh. Group of foxes and group of chickens. So the kids then went back to the tables and started making maps for Rosie's cousin to find Rosie. Early childhood educators all know the value of play. So for someone like Marilyn to be coming and saying, this is paramount, is just perfect. The 
children. So I hope that's given you a little taste, a quick overview of a conceptual play world, what it looks like in practice. Um, but to plan for your own, building your own conceptual play world, um, there are many things to think about and we're going to walk through the, the five characteristics. So the first characteristic, so this is the, the planning pro forma. And so I'm stepping you through the five characteristics. So it's not necessarily in the order in which you would implement this, but it is how you might be thinking about planning for it along the five things that you would take into consideration. So the first thing, I don't know if you can actually see me at all. <laughs> um, I'm hoping you can. Uh, let me just do a little check. Um, so I can see myself and, and we can we can see you, Marilyn. Oh, beautiful. Great. Thank you for letting me know. And me right. very clearly. Oh, perfect. Thank you for that. It's always good to know. Yeah. Um, so um, so this is so I've put myself on screen so I can actually now see, make sure I hold this up. But um, what I wanted to share with you is in the five characteristics of a conceptual play. Well, the first one is selecting a book. And why that's really important is that. Um, most people think if you're going to introduce STEM, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, that it has to somehow be like a, um, a, a book like this. You know, this says what makes light, and this has lots of lots of things in it. I'm just making sure you can see it. It's, it's interesting that it's. I have to hold it here. I've just worked out what the problem is. So, um, and and it has lots of lots of things about about. Uh, light, electricity, and so on, or a book like this on tortures. So, but that's not what I mean in terms of thinking about planning for a conceptual play world. You might use books like these somewhere, but it's more important to have a book with lots of drama in it. And some of you may this may know this one. This, this is actually one of the books that I used to have when I was a preschool teacher. And, um, and so the spooky old tree uh, is beautiful because it, it has in it um, has in it a sort of a context which deals with uh, the three bears, one with a light, one with a stick, one with the ropes and, and a spooky old tree. And of course, there's a huge adventure in it. Now, choosing a book like that, that's got it adventure, um, excitement, emotionally charged, because it's pretty scary going into a spooky old tree, um, is really important for planning a conceptual play world. So, and But it might be that you choose something more complex, like a chapter book, and you might or you might tell stories, uh, or you might even use fairy tales. And I don't know what the policy is in New Zealand about fairy tales, um, but we know from longstanding research that fairy tales are really dramatic and that they have levels of emotional engagement from very low level um, engagement of, of the emotions through to really scary scenarios, as I'm sure you know. And um, so selecting a story that's enjoyable for adults and children is really important. Something where you can build empathy with the characters, where you want to help the character solve a problem that arises. So in the story of Rosie's Walk, of course, um, the, the chicken is going around the yard. So the children are building this. They can see that the chicken is in a situation where the fox could pounce at any moment. So it's building some sort of emotional tension. So that's um, uh, part of the plot that lends itself to introducing some sort of problem and to dramatisation. And that you might think can bring some interesting concepts um, to the story that you might want to solve. So the first characteristic is very much about selecting a really interesting story, cre creating that emotional connection. As you know, with Rosie's Walk, there is that, you know, you're, you're, the children are there living the story, knowing that Rosie's oblivious to it. And so, so that's exciting. And in the planning of that, it's thinking through how you might introduce this. And in my case, when I introduced this to Belinda's children, um, we the children retold the story and I brought along a whole lot of props that were symbolic of, of Rosie's um, farmyard, so the pond, the hay, the haystack and so on, and getting ready to visit Rosie's farm. So, and, and lots of photos of the... Um, of of different kinds of chickens. And I chose this book particularly because it was a rural community and I knew that they had a lot of knowledge about chickens, different types of chickens and so on. And we also to create a bit more drama too, I used my phone and I had on the phone already um, preloaded 
fox noises. And I introduced that when we were discussing, um, discussing the story and that created even more tension because of course, many of the children said knew what that was. And in fact, one child said, you're using YouTube, aren't you? It was it was was really amazing. Um, so so these so this is also about planning how you might think about introducing something. So fox noises um, is quite good fun to include for increasing the drama. So that was the first characteristic. So it's about selecting the story and thinking about adventures, thinking about drama, thinking about emotional tension, and so on. Then the second characteristic um, is about um, designing a um, conceptual play world space. So this is the idea where the storybook creates, creates, the, creates the imaginary situation with the children, and um, which is a little different to say setting up um, a little mini area um, with props and things, although you can do that as well. The idea in, the, in choosing the book and then planning where might this imaginary space be is to really think about how you would jump into the story and how might you become characters of the story including the teachers um, and and this and what what would be a really good space for that and so so does because you in thinking through planning different opportunities for representing children's ideas and expressing their understanding so how can they do it do this where, where will this imaginary situation be so we'll have a look at um, um, what what I did Step here two, designing a conceptual play world space designing the space for the whole group it is important to find an area in the center where all the children and teachers can imagine a new situation. In this case, outside the classroom was Rosie's farm. A sign on the door signaled the transition to the conceptual play world. A small playground physically represented the hen house and a small play set acted as a beehive. Other elements such as the pond or the haystack could be imagined as the chickens made their way around the farm creating different spaces that give opportunities for exploring both concepts and social and emotional development. Concepts like spatial relations can be physically acted out, moving around the pond, across the yard and past the mill. Social and emotional development occurs through empathizing with not only Rosie, but also the fox, playing out each scenario as the different characters, designing different opportunities for child-initiated play in ways that develop the play plot further or explore concepts and make them more personally meaningful. By mapping out the farm, children can focus on certain concepts and draw out more meaningful and personal connections to them. It is important to plan opportunities for children to represent their ideas and express their understandings. For this example, the children's ideas could be represented and their understandings expressed through a mind map of features of the farm. So that just gives um, gives an overview of of um, of that of the designing the imaginary space and and this so it's kind of questions to be thinking about when planning where will the imaginary situation be what part of the center will be used they're the kind of questions to be thinking about we and um, this then takes us to the third planning characteristic of a um, play world and that's thinking about how you enter and how you exit this imaginary situation and why this is really important is because it, it gives the possibility for creating some sort of routine um, to enter that or some sort of symbol. In this case, um, having the sign on the door um, was very important for that process. Um, and, um, and so, but what's really significant is to go in and out of the imaginary situation as a whole group. Uh, so that takes us to the fourth uh, planning ca characteristic. And this is what's really important uh, and different from say, for those of you who know Play Worlds um, that was developed by Ganilla Lindquist, in a conceptual play world, um, we've the work that we've done um, over 10 years of research to build this model has shown us that actually the central problem of how to bring concepts, um, STEM concepts into children's play um, has shown us that 
coming up with authentic um, problem scenarios that children want to solve in the play is really important. So planning that beforehand um, is, is really is a key part of this. And it is very different to Ganilla's work because she wasn't interested in STEM concepts. And most of the researchers that have followed her, there's many play world researchers around the world, um, have not focused on STEM. And our work, as I said, over 10 years has looked specifically at, at this area and um, of STEM concept formation. But, but STEM concept formation so that the play of the children is enriched and the play is matured and that, that children want to be able to solve the problem because they want to help the character. So they want to help Rosie um, uh, they, and or whatever the problem that you might introduce because that's when we start to go beyond the story and we can introduce our own problems. And I'm going to share with you on this video how we did that. Step four, planning the inquiry. Introduce the problem to the children inside or outside the imaginary situation. Marilyn had a heap of maps of Mount Barker, of the whole town, and then zooming in closer of the school. So the kids all had some time looking at maps, really enjoyed looking, going, oh, there's my house, there's such and such, there's our school, there's our playground equipment. So it had time exploring the maps. Problem scenario is not scripted, but a general idea of the problem is planned. And then with all the noise going on, Marilyn said, oh my goodness, I've just got a, a, a voice message and it's from Rosie's cousin. The problem scenario is dramatic and engaging. So then the kids all just went, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? It's important to plan what concepts the children will learn from solving the problem. For the Rosie's Walk example, the concepts identified are map reading, plan view orientation, prepositional language, and spatial relations, keeping in mind that all concepts are in service of the play. It then sort of came up that maybe we should make some maps, like the maps we had just been looking at, so that Rosie's cousin could find Rosie. So planning this part of the... Um of the conceptual play world is really important. So thinking about the initial problem, um, and in the case, you know, after visiting the farm, finding a voice message from Rosie's cousin to say she, she'd like to visit, and then later on deepening the problem and creating a sense of urgency. So when we went out and role played, we came back and, and I actually played another one, uh, another voice message and said, while we're away, um, there was another message and, and, and it was uh, Rosie, the hen's um, cousin, saying, I'm still lost. I think I need a map and I can hear. Bok, 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 I can hear um, fox sounds. So, again, making it more dramatic. And, um, and this, of course, motivated the, the children to, um, to want to really help and, um, and to solve this problem about how to get Rosie's cousin um, to the farm safely. And you can see some lovely examples of, of the different maps that the children had created. And, and having had this collective experience as a group, um, it made a lot of sense for the children to document their thinking in this way. Then the fifth characteristic, um, this one's a really important one, um, but it's you can take baby steps in planning it. Uh, because in early childhood, we always work in teams. So we have adults, um, more than one adult in a room. Um, this lends itself really nicely to having um, what Elena Crafts over from um, uh, Russia calls um, pedagogical um, uh, pairs. And, um, and what she talks about uh, in relation to pedagogical pairs is that you can have two adults and the children um, in character, in role, um, but the adults, uh, the teachers can take somewhat slightly different roles. And she's come up with five um, five ways, I think, just trying to remember how many there are, um, 
And one of them is where the teacher is in the above position to the children, so therefore telling the children something or leading the children in some way, which, of course, we do as teachers. But also we can be in the under position where we're inquiring and asking questions. And, of course, early childhood, as early childhood teachers, we do that as well because we're encouraging the children to come up with the ideas. Um, and there is also um, equal position that she names, which is where it's kind of like we're a team. You know, let's let's go and solve this problem together. How will we do this together? And um, and so that's important. So the equal position, and then there's also a position that what's called the primordial we position, which is where a child might be feeling a little anxious to know how to enter the play, for instance, and so. The adult, uh, the, the teacher and the child will be like connected by an umbilical cord, so to speak, metaphorically, um, whereby um, the two together go in and the teacher is, is really sort of talking for the child. Um, and in time, of course, the child will do that. But in the first instance, the, the teacher is with the child together almost as, as one unit. And, uh, and that's really important in the play world because um, there will be moments where particular children will need support and and so the teacher can work together with the with the child um, speaking for them in essence if you like or acting for them and then withdrawing over time as they need less support and, and I'm sure you have also undertake that role as well and um, and so there and then there's the independent position which is where the child like a teenager learning to drive, I can do this on my own, um, but is constantly socially referencing back to their family, as the two-year-old often does as well, where they, you know, they're going to do it, me do it, and but they socially reference back to their families to make sure. So that's sort of on a long lead, if you like. And so you can take those different ways and think about it in relation to not just the two teachers, one in the above position and one with the children, um, which creates really nice modelling, or even in the under position where one teacher um, says to the other, oh, how do we do this? What should we do? And the other teacher says, well, let's let's do a, a map of all the ideas that we might have so that together we can go forward. So it's this planning these roles, but also it's not just the teachers, it's also the children planning these different, not planning them, um, we plan them as educators, but the children being supported to be in the above position, uh, to be in the equal position. Uh, obviously, children can be in the under position, um, they can recognise that they need to be in the primordial we position. And we have a lovely example of one of our um, conceptual play world projects where the, um, the teacher um, had was doing the play world of um, Robin Hood. And one of the children who had some challenges with expressing his understandings would recognise uh, that he needed he needed to be in a primordial we position. So part of the narrative of the play of that play world was that there was uh, a dragon that was introduced into the story, um, because you don't have to stay with the characters in the book. You can have lots of cousins, you know, Rosie's cousin, or you can have dragons who join. So you know, it depends on children's interest and and how many children want to take on different roles. Um, or they can be a tree, or they can be a gate and let children in and out and so on. But this, in this example of this child who's um, had some challenges with expressing himself, um, he, he said to um, the teacher, one of the two teachers, um, you be the dragon, you be mummy dragon, and I'll be baby dragon. And so he positioned himself in the primordial we position. So he was requesting that support so that um, he could whisper to mummy dragon what he really wanted to say, and mummy dragon would, would then articulate. And, and he just flourished in that environment because before that he couldn't he couldn't express to the children what he wanted to really do in the play and therefore he was excluded. This way he was really a part of the play because he had the teacher in Mummy Dragon role, but he was really in many respects leading Mummy Dragon to where he wanted to go. And Mummy Dragon knew the child really well, so was able to interpret from just a few words what he was seeking to try and do. So there are examples of, of how children and teachers can take on these different roles. But in the first instance, if you decide that you interested to try out a conceptual play world just think about planning in the above position the equal position and the under position and role modeling because um, 
it, in the process of two teachers even having interactions, you're modelling to the children really nice ways to inquire, to ask questions, um, to, um, to try out ideas and so on, because one can ask questions and this models some beautiful um, ways that children can, can then go forward. And our research is showing it really matters if, if they have this rich environment where the teachers are play partners with the children. They've changed their role from being, play, from being the teacher to being the play partner. And all our research shows that the children just love it. Um, they just think it's amazing that they can have this different relationship with their teachers in, in character. So it's not that they're... Or the, it's not that they're um, becoming children. It's what they're doing is they're all different characters in the story. They're jumping into the book, into the imaginary situation. And it's super exciting for, for all of the children. Step five, planning interactions. In conceptual play worlds, teachers plan their interactions with each other and in relation to the children. Classroom teacher Mrs. O'Day is with the foxes, planning on how to catch Rosie and the other chickens. Support teacher Mrs. Batchelor takes on the hen role and invites other chickens to be a part of her clutch. Visiting professor Marilyn Fleer takes on the role of bees and invites children to join her hive of bees. There are different roles teachers can take. Teachers plan their role in the play world a number of ways. To be equally present with the children or to model practices in a role. Conceptual intentions are planned. Before setting out into the play world, teachers plan who will have more knowledge and who will be present with the children to model solving the problem. Story reading. In the reading of the story, teachers taking on different roles allow the possibility of children to empathize with the different characters. Different possibilities can be explored. Is Rosie ignoring the fox or is Rosie tricking the fox? So that was just a quick a quick overview. So planning the interactions is is really important part of this. And, and even if you don't write it, if you just think about what role you're going to take and have that conversation with your with your um, co-teachers, that's really um, important. And you can see here all the things that were just on the video. So this then takes us to what it looks like in practice across the early childhood cultural age span. And the, the reason I use cultural age span from infancy to early years of school is because um, this is not a biological predetermined view of what a child can do. This is actually saying if we create different conditions because we're cultural humans, um, everything we do is a cultural practice, then, and I don't mean this in terms of ethnicity, I mean this in terms of things that we've invented. So cultural knowledge is not just out there, it's knowledge that, um, that we have of us as humans and what we've invented. So just to make that distinction, uh, I know there's many different interpretations of that term, but it's to say the cultural age span is really about this notion of not so much about infants, toddlers, preschool, or school age children, but it's actually about the conditions we create and how we support our youngest learners. So what we're going to do is have a look at this whole idea of a conceptual play world in relation to infants and toddlers. And this is a, a video of just two minutes um, because as I mentioned in the introduction, I'm very passionate about this area and I'm hoping, I'm hoping some of you who are working with infants and toddlers will make connections with me, um, not just in relation to this, but in relation to taking some of this work forward. In a science, technology and engineering play world, infants wander, imagine and explore, and educators create conditions for their learning. Based on research, this video is an example of an evidence-based model of play pedagogy designed to support and promote the exploration and learning of our youngest scientists, engineers and technologists. We can help you design your own STEM play world. When teachers design imaginary play situations, they support children's sense of wonder and exploration. We know from research that imagination and play is critical for the learning of STEM concepts. But how do we set up a STEM play world for infants and toddlers at your centre? Let's look at how the educators at Windermere Early Learning Centre set up their conceptual play world 
for young infants, toddlers and the under threes. The educators collectively chose the story of Possum in the House by Kirsten Jensen. In the story, children experience the drama of the naughty possum going all over the house. This story was the starting point to turn the whole childcare centre into a possum adventure. The big problem was, how do we get the possum out of the house? To answer this, there were all sorts of things to find out about possums. What sounds do they make? What do they eat? How do they eat? Where should they live? How do you catch a possum? What's the best way to relocate them with kindness? And um, and as I was um, watching this now with you, I was thinking, oh gosh, I should have said beforehand. I know possums are a problem in in New Zealand. Um, so, but you get the get the idea. This is really relevant for Australian context where we love possums. Um, so let's um, have a look at um, the. Um, so you can see all of the characteristics were in that context, all of the planning, the five characteristics were there, thinking about the imaginary situation where they go, what was the problem going on a possum hunt, um, relocating the possum with kindness and so on. And, um, <clears throat> and you can see all the different dimensions, you know, the different roles that the educators, the teachers were taking and so on. But now we're going to look at um, a, um, a story of Victoria in Samoa. And so I want to share this with you because it's a beautiful example of, uh, of a, a, an, amazing, an amazing early childhood teacher who um, <clears throat> encountered a challenge and reached out to me through Twitter. And, um, and, she, and she had been um, trying out different um, play worlds and, 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 and I'd been having communications with her about what she was doing. And, um, and that towards the end of the school year, she, um, she contacted me and she said, oh, she said, I'm going to resign. I'm going to resign. And I said, oh, why? And she said, well, she said, the principal of the school at the time has come to my centre and said, you must set up, um, you must become more formal now because they're going to go to school next year. So I want the children to learn to put up their hands. I want them to learn how to fill in um, worksheets. I want them to learn, you know, how to sit still and sit at desks and so on. And she was just horrified, <laughs> as you can imagine. And um, and she said, well, I'm going to resign. And I said, well, let's, let's think about this in a new way. Why don't we, because, she, you know, her focus is transition, but why don't we um, create a conceptual play world that's about um, having a, um, a school within the centre. So in other words, go and designing your own play world for doing schooling. So this means going to the school and researching what the children are doing uh, in the school, interviewing the teacher, interviewing the other children about the rules and about the roles and so on, and, and then taking it back and using that knowledge, making it conscious, making the consciousness of the rules uh, um, explicit through creating their own play world. And so, so you can see here they're creating a sign to name their um, school play world, so creating their own props that they're going to have. And, um, you know, they've collected materials that they can copy and use. And, um, you know, they can be the teacher doing schooling, uh, making the rules of schooling really explicit in the play. And it's all fun and everyone can laugh. Um, being a school child, a teacher, um, and um, exploring what they've seen, bringing those artefacts back and using them. Um, and um, and so, so um, Victoria reflected on this experience and she said, this was an update at the time, our school play world has taken on a life of its own. The children have taken ownership of this play world and have co-constructed uh, letter, number and sight word books together, sight word games and homework to take home for their parents to work on. And the children will role play um, uh, as a teacher at every opportunity and I'm now the student as they explore the role responsibilities and through play demonstrate their social construction of the teacher and the school it was very informative and insightful so this is a, just a little example of how you can come across a challenge uh, as Victoria did and of course this had a really good outcome um, I, I put this it was so beautiful I put it into the the 
um, a book that I wrote on play. So some of you who may have that book would recognise it. But what was really beautiful is that she went from wanting to resign to becoming the pedagogical leader in the school, <laughs> which I was just delighted for. So she, and you, if you're interested, you can jump onto our free Facebook um, and share uh, where you can you can ask questions, but also find out more about what she did. So there's some more examples there of her beautiful work, and many other teachers who've done um, done some amazing play worlds are on this Facebook. There's lots of really nice examples, and I post videos and have conversations with people. So I do encourage you to come and join that Facebook along with all your other Facebooks because I know it's very popular. So that takes me to the end of looking at what does this look like in practice um, for the infancy to early years. And I, what I wanted to share with you was that what, what we've been doing is making available resources. We have the website, uh, we have an app with the videos I've just shared with you that you can have a look at. Um, and we have other videos as well uh, on the um, uh, YouTube channel. Now it's not curated, it's just as we produce a video it goes up. So you can just search through and find something that's of interest and relevance. I oft, I've got a really nice video on there. I think it's nice because it was fun to do, um, where I talk about the difference between between these two in the way that I've just chatted with you, um, but many other books as well. So I give some examples of Play World Starters. We've just started a podcast last year, um, and um, which has a, a series of podcasts of what we're learning from our uh, research. And we have a newsletter if you want to find out what we're doing. Everything's free. Um, please take the opportunity. The planning pro forma and everything, pop play, play well pop-ups like Rosie's Walk and more involved ones that use chapter books are also there. And if you're in the school sector, we also have school-based um, resources as well. But what we do have, which I really want to encourage you to do, is the sort of like my last video, um, is um, we, we're trying to bring people into our research to participate in what we're doing. And we have a self-paced, um, fully online PD that you can do. And there's a little survey that you do at the beginning, takes about 15 minutes. And then you do one after you've implemented your own play world, you do the, the survey again. But what we, what we want to do is capture um, all the amazing ideas, what you learn through this experience, um, and so that we can collectively put this information together um, to support people in New Zealand, in Samoa, in Australia, uh, in Indonesia. I was doing a presentation for Indonesia yesterday. So there's a real um, appetite for wanting to know how to bring concepts into play. And our research has shown that this, this is a really good way to do it because it's so exciting and motivating. And the five characteristics you probably would have gathered um, a little different to just doing role play or a little different to doing a story. This is about having a jumping into the book in a way, being the characters, having these problems that arise, going on adventures to solve. And you can do one in a day like I shared here as a pop-up play world, or you can have one, you know, where you, you revisit the same story but you introduce a, a new problem. So, for instance, instead of um, Rosie's cousins sending a, a voice message, they might, they might have some other problem that arises, you know, where, they, where Rosie says, oh, the pond's dried up and we need water. Uh, it's, it, it's leaking. I need some engineers to come and help solve this problem. So the role play and the problem scenario could be out in the sandpit and the children can be investigated, going onto YouTube, well, how do you seal um, and, and create a pond so that it doesn't leak. Why do some ponds leak and others don't? What lives in a pond? You can see how you could go on, on, on and on and on. Or you might have a, a little um, um, a little box that's sitting in the, um, the hen house and uh, inside the box is, is another problem that arises. So when they go out to role play, they go out to Rosie's farm, they find this box and inside the box there's a note and in that, that note says da 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 whatever it might be that the problem arises and because you would plan that. Um, so they're just, you know, ways that you can do that. But coming back to what I was really sharing here was that um, do follow me on Twitter if you're a Twitter Twitter nerd like me, because uh, I often post um, ideas uh, or I turn what I see into a conceptual play world or I just send nice photos of, of where I live, uh, my environment. Um, but this is the recruitment video that I wanted to share with you so you can you get a sense. It's only, um, it's only a minute and a half. 
Do you want to foster scientific curiosity, develop mathematical logic, and instill design and engineering thinking in children? The conceptual play world is a play-based model that can help you do this. It's based on some of the world's best research and inspires young children to form concepts in STEM, especially girls. We want to support you in pioneering play worlds in your preschool, family daycare, school, or childcare center. You can opt for a two hour interactive online session with Laureate Professor Marilyn Flair and her team from the Conceptual Play Lab at Monash University. The session will be tailored to you and your needs. All you need to do is bring along your favorite children's book, stories you and your children will love. What happened here? The book is trying to catch the chicken. Or if you prefer self-paced learning, there's an option to work through our modules online. They're packed with videos, prompts, and resources to support you. And because it's all online, you can do our workshop or online training from anywhere in Australia or around the world. Contact the Conceptual Play Lab to sign up for your personalized professional development. The Conceptual Play World, where imagination in STEM meets imagination in play. So that concludes my presentation. Um, and um, Angela said that the session was for an hour and we had need time for Q&A. So I left plenty of time for Q&A, but I understood from today, <laughs> talking to Angela, that she's actually allocated even more time. <laughs> That's okay, Marilyn. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat now. We'd love to see those. And uh, I'll share those with Marilyn. Um, I do have a question, actually, Marilyn. How, how long have you um, did it take for this research? How long has it been going for? Yeah, beautiful question, Angela. Um, we, the original model, the conceptual play world model, um, took about, it took 10 years of research. And um, because I started with the, I started um, with the, I had I had about six Australian Research Council grants, which is for those of you who know, I think it's like the Marsden Foundation in New Zealand, where you you get prestigious money, <laughs> not not a lot of money, but a, it's a pres, prestigious um, grant. And so the first one that I had was looking at um, the relationship between play and learning, and um, and then that built over time because as I learned more about this relationship, I recognised uh, because I was interested in science in the early days. I'm now interested also in, in engineering as well because um, it's you know preschool centres are just amazing engineering sites. Um, but this research was really significant from the point of view that. Um, every every grant that I got, I learned that little bit more. And right through to the last part of the grant where I learned not only the use of digital tools to enhance this, to amplify the learning, um, but but all, and the play, the play and learning, how to use digital tools in the play in ways that enhances this concept formation. But what but I also learned um, was that how important it is for, because um, one of the things that bothered me, I have to share this, one of the things that bothered me is that every time I went to a science conference uh, in the early years, uh, not early years education, but early years of my life, <laughs> um, I would go to presentations and they'd say things like, yeah, but early childhood teachers and primary teachers just don't teach STEM. And, I was, and, and it used to really annoy me. And after after probably 10 years of hearing the same story, the same blaming the victim, I thought, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to actually, because all of this research that was out there was all about watering down a formal setting into a preschool and calling it science. And, and really, play-based settings are so different because the problem's different because it, because children are so motivated to play. And if you can set up a problem in the play, then they, they gobble up. The, the learning, <laughs> as we know, and in STEM, it's it's um, it's even more exciting. So for me, the problem was with the models, and we we're expecting um, early childhood teachers to to be able to um, feel confident and competent in STEM teaching with models that were never designed for play-based settings. So I, over ten years, I researched the birth to five area. Um, and I've scaled that up with the infants and toddlers now because we're following infants and toddlers, COVID's got a bit in the way, to really understand what is it that they 
that you know the phenomenon that they're interested in so they're interested in rainbows but what's the concept well it's the concept of light and refracting the light into the colors of the rainbow so what we're trying to do is is see how their their how, how they think about the world and how the world can be enriched from infants to toddlers to preschoolers and and have a really good model so it's 10 years of research finding that out this is what's come from it the conceptual play world and also another concept early on was conceptual play that was kind of a nice way to name how you can create it's not to say you do this all the time this this is you know instead of reading a story and then having activities on the table, you might decide that week you're going to do conceptual play worlds and, and you might turn the whole centre, like the possum, um, you know, the whole centre became a possum hunt inside and outside, but that, that took place just over a week. And then things were back in the normal routine of, you know, child-initiated play and all the other things. So it's to say, it's to say this 10 years of research has generated this. We've learned a lot about... Um, how to introduce it. So um, the research I have done in the last in this last two years um, prior, uh, uh, with our laureate fellowship funding um, has been to look at the best way to share this. And of course, webinars is a fantastic way. The self-paced learning is another way. The Zoom, we're using Zoom to do the PDs um, as you saw in the recruitment video. Uh, and that's a lot of fun too. But I, can I just share one thing while people are thinking about their questions? Um, one of the things that we also have done is that we've got our storyteller who creates play worlds through Zoom into family homes, and that is mind-blowingly exciting. So, so that's for another time, but just to, to whet your appetite to say, you know, play groups, you know, look no more for <laughs> how to do STEM. We've got a storyteller that can do play worlds in your home. Uh, but anyway, sorry, long-winded response. I promise I won't be that long with the others. <laughs> You're on mute. Um. My mouth is moving, but there's no sound coming out. Apologies. <laughs> there is a question here from Barbara, and she's asking, how do teachers identify the concepts that become the focus of play worlds? Does your planning differentiate what different children want to or need to learn, and if so, how? Oh, Barbara, that is such an, a key question. One, one of the big shifts in this particular programming um, <clears throat> of, of planning a, a play world, a uh, conceptual play world, has, um, has been actually about not thinking about um, individual children all having their own individual needs for a particular concept, so, so not planning an individual concept per child. In other words, not saying I'm following the interest of Mary, I'm following the interest of Zach, I'm following the interests of Daisy, and I'm going to introduce all these different things. Not at all like that. It's more um, to create these imaginary play situations. I'll come back to what constitutes the concept. Create these imaginary play situations and introducing some sort of drama, excitement that they want to solve. And this is for all the children. But when you create this imaginary situation, there is so much child agency and you get to know um, even more so because you're in the imaginary situation. Our research is showing us that when teachers are in the imaginary situation with the children, they are so in tune, more so than being on the outside watching play and then watching another set of play over here and another set of play over there. It's actually the teachers with the children in the imaginary play situation together, and they're actively orchestrating and supporting the process. You know, you're working at, your mind's working at 100 miles an hour. Um, and of course, that's what early childhood teachers do really well because they know play, they know development. And so it's, it's planning for the collective it's planning a collective play scenario. We all go into the play together. We all come out of the play together. And that's why I said it's not happening every minute of the day. But we already do that when we have group time. You know, we have a circle time. We plan for everybody to be there. So this is, this is about taking that one step further and planning to be in the imaginary situation instead of group time. You might use group time to read the story or tell the story, but you actually then move directly on another day or that afternoon into the imaginary place situation and be the characters. So it's not about following individual interests. It's not about planning for individuals. It's plan, 
uh, it's planning for, um, for the group to be engaged in imaginary play. And then you can start to think about individuals because you're noticing, you know, the child who has language expression problems who needs to be in the primordial we position. So you plan to support that child. Um, there might be a child who says, I'm too big to play, you know, and we do have that <laughs> occasionally. I want to be a learner. I don't want to be a player. You know, that's baby stuff. And we had one of those children in the school sector. They didn't want to be, you know, because he'd come to school to learn and he didn't want to play anymore, which is a bit sad. But anyway, um, so the teacher planned within the play world for that child to um, be the reporter and of course they were role playing being a reporter had to learn about how to be a reporter how to document how to take the ipad out and and you know how to write it up in a report how to present it and so on as part of that play world then so that's to give you that sense of collectiveness so barbara then the question about concepts selecting the concept it really it depends if you're taking um your curriculum documents and you're thinking about what, what are the big ideas in science? Uh, what are the big ideas in technologies? You know, what are the big ideas in mathematics? So you saw um, with Rosie's walk, it lent itself beautifully to um, role-playing prepositional language going over, under, behind, and so on. So you, sometimes you can look at the, the book and it can give you inspiration. But it can also, um, like I shared with this, um, the spooky old tree, you can look at this and you say, well, okay, I can. I know that I can use this to explore light if I wanted to, because there's a, a light, a torch, or I can even explore electricity, and I can get have activities where um, part of the part of the research that the children do to enrich their play. So they come out of the play world and they say, "We want to help the bear." You know, the the bear needs their own torch. So let's, let's make a torch for the bear. And so therefore you're thinking through electrical circuits and you're saying, well, you know, connect. And of course it's rudimentary. Um, and so you're thinking about what are the ways in which the drama can continue. And, and then of course they make the, the, the torch for the bear, but in the role play it falls apart. So why, what's happened? The circuit's broken. <laughs> so what can we do? Oh, can we make it brighter? How do we make the bulb shine more? And so, you know, or the bear might leave a note that says, you know, good try everyone, but really, you know, I'm still scared in the dark. You know, those, those, three, those three little bears that came to visit me, um, they're the ones that are scaring me, you know, in the spooky old tree, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so, that's, um, so that's in response to um, your question, Barbara. And I did take a long time. <laughs> Sorry. No problem, Marilyn. The, um, the next question is, um, I'm with infants and toddlers, ages two and younger. Are there different ways we can incorporate this in their learning? Or do we take the child's lead and see where it goes? Uh, lovely, lovely question, Rebecca. Um, one, of, one of the things we kind of with infants and toddlers, what we've learned, it's so interesting, what we've learned by, because we've been video recording the play worlds with infants and toddlers, and then we've been analysing what the children are doing in relation to what the teacher's doing. What we learned, which is just incredible, is that when infants and toddlers are in a conceptual play world with their teacher, there is a real sense of collective imagining. And, and it's just incredible. Um, because, and the children use puppets, they use, because, or they make, you know, in this, say, well, we use the Windermere um, <clears throat> possum in the house as an example. Um, so they might make a, a noise that sounds a bit like a possum. And immediately, you know, the other children are around and they know because they, they've all got the same story. The book's in the environment constantly. And you might have seen that what we did was, uh, in the video was that you probably don't know the story uh, because it wouldn't be so relevant in New Zealand. <laughs> but um, the possum in the house, what we did was we had the real story, but we recreated it by taking photos of the children's environment in the centre. And then we put the words and we had a cut out laminated possum that was with a bit of blue tack that was stuck and on the pages that they could lift and put into the into the different scenarios. So in the kitchen, we had a, a photo of their real kitchen in the center, um, in the, um, the sleeping area. So when the possum went into the bedrooms, we had their sleeping area. So what we did was we created the play world in a meaningful way for infants and toddlers. And we had all the pages laminated, we had it big, we had it on the floor. 
And, and so what we've learned is that these children are with the teacher are collectively imagining. As soon as, soon as the, the puppet comes out, which was just a possum, sort of, you know, like, like the bears, um, <clears throat> as soon as the puppet was there, the children were together with the teacher in the imaginary situation and when they were making the noises and we had all the artefacts and so on. And what we noticed when they weren't doing that, when the teacher didn't put all of those things out in the environment and be on the floor with the children to be in a play world, um, going on adventures, you know, crawling around the room and then going outside and looking, what we noticed was there wasn't a sense of collectiveness. The children were off doing their own thing and, um, and, and, and what we thought that was really important is that when, and this is, I think, an under-researched area or not such a well-understood area, is that when you first bring your children into a centre, particularly infants and toddlers, you're really trying to, to create a sense of community and collectiveness. And nowhere in documentation of being a good early childhood teacher or quality early childhood environment does that particular collectiveness, uh, uh, creating that collectiveness actually um, arise. It's not written about. Um, and we think this is really important because the educators were doing it beautifully, but it, but what happened over time, because as I said, they did this over a week, that sense of collective play really grew. And it was just beautiful to see infants and toddlers in these imaginary situations, being possums, putting possums to bed, putting blanket over them, trying to feed the possums, looking at the iPads, at, at possums um, eating and so on and the noises they make. So, so in many respects, um, the sense of, and of course, this is where, you know, when the child takes some initiative by picking up the possum, I have a bear here, but picking up the possum, then the teacher can have an interaction with them and say, oh, shall we go into the play world, bring the book over and start the conversation. And, and we saw children doing this to each other. They were picking up this and inviting the other children in. So that sense of collectiveness by the end of the week between the children was emerging. But the props were really important as part of that process because, of course, the infants and toddlers can't tell you all of the things they're thinking or want to do. Um, we have to follow gestures and so on, as you know. Um, so this was really, really important. And so it's to say, create the collectiveness and then within that, stay alert to the initiatives, which, which is about, about seeing that they're, they're, they're wanting to do this. And then the more um, excitement you create, the more that the infants and toddlers will do the same things and do it with each other. And, and that, to me, is... The children showing that the imagination is developing, but also that they're developing collective imaginary play, which people say, oh, infants can't do that. Well, they do. <laughs> they do do it. So, so, so what I think I'm hearing you say there, Marilyn, is that while it may initially be te teacher initiated and teacher led, as the play evolves, it, uh, it becomes more responsive to children's initiations and um inquiries and questions and play and the teachers then start to follow the lead of the children yeah I think um I think one of the things um that we're probably um um exploring um is that um when and we've, we've seen this in some of our research with preschoolers older children as well one of the things we've noticed is that when you one, one of our PhD students who's graduated now, Rebecca Lewis, she, she was really unhappy with following the children's interests all the time because she said she never went deep. She couldn't go deep into something. She couldn't introduce lots of things because she was too busy following that child and then that child and that child. And she was really unhappy with this. She said she felt like she wasn't performing the depth of um, experience that she would have really liked. And she also said, and this is this is the example of the child with language expression, she also said, she said, and some children don't tell you what they're interested in. Um, you have because they have challenges or they're not as verbal or that's not their way of communicating. You know, they do it in different ways. And she said, she said that the minute she tried out the conceptual play world, she said her whole center was transformed. She said it privileged. It privileged all children. All children were active in the experience. But she also said, I didn't know 
And the children didn't know they were interested in some things until I'd introduced it. So that's the teacher led. And when the and so this is where you're responsive. You introduce an experience. It's like it's like adults. You know, I don't know whether I'd like to do yoga because I've never done it. But maybe if I went and did it, I'd probably go, oh, yeah, I actually really like this. So um, unless you have the experience, and we think about an infant, they haven't been in the world for very long. Think about a preschooler. They haven't really been in the world for that long. Their, their experiences will, won't be a, as rich as somebody who's 30 or 40 years old as me. And so therefore you don't, you don't they, children don't always know what they're interested in. So I guess what I'm saying is why not have this, because I'm saying not do this all the time, but instead of reading a story at group time, at circle time, and then having follow-up activities where you might follow their interests, why not try a conceptual play world where you, where the, the glue that keeps the group together is the narrative of the book? And within that narrative, sometimes as children become experienced play partners in this, they initiate problems. You know, they'll say, um, and they did in the in the example of the uh, Robin Hood. Um, the children introduced themselves, they introduced new characters, and that's why they had a um, had a dragon because they decided they wanted a dragon in their story. So the story got more complex, and that's why the scenario of mummy dragon, and we had three dragons, dragons often because, you know, different children wanted to be dragons on different days, and they could fly over and, and look down at the castle and see it from a plan view and do some beautiful drawings to work out an escape plan. But none of that would have happened if, if the children hadn't have had the rich experience of the story, role-playing and so on, which was, which was initiated by the teachers, which was enriched by the teachers. But the teachers in the imaginary play situation, uh, as I mentioned, they are so in tune with others and uh, with the children and their initiatives. So when they do initiate something um, and, and, it, and it evolves and the other children are interested in it, it then can be amplified. So next time you can say, do you remember when we visited, um, when we visited Sherwood Forest and, um, and Maid Marian was the engineer and, and talked to the castle engineer and learned about X, Y, Z? Um, I've brought along some things today that we can take when we go back in time to Sherwood Forest, when we go into the time machine and, and explore, um, you know, the, the Sherwood Forest and try and get the treasure out of the castle to give to the, give to the villagers who are poor and hungry. Um, but I've got some ideas here. Does anyone else have some ideas? And so on and so forth. So it's to give teachers in the play quite an active role, but also to be very responsive at the same time. So I'm not saying... I'm probably framing it differently to what you were suggesting, Angela, because, because this is about, it's just, this is, if you decided you wanted to do a science lesson, this is your science lesson. So your science lesson is this play world. And so you don't do it all the time. But what we have learned is, and I remember that when we were filming the, the um, story of um, Robin Hood in Sherwood Forest, they had this little transition, which was, where they'd go beep, 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 beep as they went back in time. And sometimes the children were all doing things at group time, not in... world, And the teacher had to then work out how to um, deal with that. And, and did it beautifully in character. She um, she then, she went back in time with the children and said, oh, the villagers are all happy today. <laughs> um, and there's a sign on the door. And there was nothing there. She was just imagining. It's a sign on the door that said they're all out for lunch. Oh, and it's lunchtime. Maybe we should have our lunch in Sherwood Forest today. Very creative. Love it. Love it. Um, Marilyn, the, the research took 10 years. Um, so obviously some of the children that you potentially worked with initially must be um, quite a bit older by now. Have you seen, had the opportunity to gauge any longer term outcomes? Yeah, it, our, um, we, we haven't deliberately followed this 10 years. Um, we haven't deliberately followed. They were all individual teachers and in different centres that we worked with over the 10 years. But there was, um, um, and the work we're doing now, we are trying to follow the same children, but COVID's made that a bit tricky. Um, so that was the intention. But I can say to you um, that one of the families um, where uh, actually who, who was 
Maid Marian visiting the Sherwood Forest as the castle engineer. So she was the castle engineer. She was the lead engineer. She went on. Um, she's now, of course, much older in primary school. Um, and we interviewed her. Uh, well, we, we got the families to interview her because it was more appropriate. They filmed her uh, and they said, do you like science? Do you like technology? And asked her about the things she was doing. And um, she was just so switched on to science, technology and engineering and saw this as something she loved and wanted to do. And, um, and her family said it was because she, because all these play worlds that she participated in in her preschool years, and she she started from when she was three, um, built and excited her so much that that was that was her motive orientation to STEM, and because um, because it's so important to and this is also what we've learned is in the conceptual play worlds um, the and this is worthy of a whole presentation, but in the conceptual play worlds, what we've learned is that um, when the teacher is in the imaginary play situation, being a play partner, they're in tune, as I mentioned, with the children, but also in terms of the STEM in relation to girls getting a go. And so if you have a centre where traditionally the boys all um, and we know this from long-standing research, will stay in the block area longer or dominate it more or outdoor spaces, you know, will be much more phys physical in terms of the space. Not all boys, of course. I'm, I don't want to create this as a binary, but it's just to say our research has shown that um, in the play world, when, when the play world's not operating, we've done research where we followed the same children and uh, where that where engineering activities have been set up, such as um, the three billy goat scruff, and the um, and what we've noticed is that um, that the that the boys predominantly mis, um, have pushed the girls back. They try and enter, but the but the activity is always mostly the boys. And um, and I know this is a it has been a long standing problem from my career when I first started as a preschool teacher. Um, how to deal how to deal with that in a really sensitive way. Um, but in the play worlds, what we notice that the block area is no longer the block area. So if there's a pattern of a particular group of children dominating that space, it's no longer a block space. It's actually a resource hub for taking the materials and using them in the conceptual play world so 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 all of the areas in the set the all of the construction kits all of the materials are used differently and there's no pattern for boys or girls or you know cross gender or whatever it might be there's no pattern of ways of doing things and so the conceptual play world really creates a new way of playing in the imaginary situation and 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 it really gives girls a go and what that does mean in our research is that they hear it, they're in the space longer, they're hearing the technical language longer, they're hearing the scientific words longer because of, and they're researching along with the other, and they're just as interested. And, and from that comes this real passion, which is what we noticed with this particular girl that we did follow up um, over time because it was, we were able to, to do that. They, the family was very committed to the research. So great question. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds really exciting um, to to particularly for particularly for girls, as you say. That's really interesting. Um, I think there's a couple a couple more questions here, um, Marilyn, um, and I'm just conscious of the time, so um, perhaps perhaps we'll do one more. Rebecca, your question, we might be able to. I think that Marilyn might be able to answer that for you through the um, Facebook groups. More examples of ways teachers can do play worlds, because you, you said at the beginning that. Uh, sorry, further in your presentation that, that people can get examples from the Facebook group. So that might be a place to look there, Rebecca. Um, and YouTube as well. If you jump YouTube. onto YouTube, you'll see heaps and heaps of examples of Play World starters. I, I just got a whole lot. And we're going to do some more. Um, I've got a workshop planned with my clever colleagues and we're going to create some more examples. So jump onto the website, um, jump onto Facebook, um, let us know you're interested in Facebook. I've got a little video post where I, I, I'm asking for volunteers who want to try out ideas. And we're going to use the Children's Council books uh, once we get the list. We're still waiting. We hoped we'd get them now. But um, so the minute we get the list, we're going to make the Play World starters. And we're looking for people who are interested to try out the ideas. 
great. That's exciting. Good opportunities. Mm -hmm. So um, final question, Marilyn, for tonight, because um, we're just a bit out of time. As the teachers come together, is this where the sharing of ideas evolve to extend on imaginary play? Um, so I'm just trying to work out what I don't understand the question. As the teachers come together, is uh, sharing of ideas evolve to extend so is this a, is the question about the teachers or is it the question about the children? I wasn't sure, Kelly. Maybe, Kelly, you could just clarify that a little bit more. I, I could, Miss Kelly's jumped out. Oh, no. How do we extend on the play to keep it? Oh, beautiful. To keep it going. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, what we, this is really important uh, question, um, uh, Kelly. What, what we've learned in our research with teachers who are using this model is that, um, that there is a natural sort of rhythm to the play worlds. And so some, some play worlds really grab the attention of the children and they really jump into it and they initiate lots and the teachers initiate lots. But sometimes it starts to, you know, as you're planning, it starts to lose its momentum. And what we've noticed is that when teachers then introduce a new play inquiry, so and I'll give you a quick, I'll try to be quick, um, example of, and I'll stick with, um, um, I'll stick with the story of Robin Hood. So in that play world, um, the teachers, because they did that for 10 weeks, um, not every day, but they did it for 10 weeks and they had a couple of days per week, but also the children jumped in when they wanted to by going beep, 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 uh, and, and when the teachers agreed and off they went. But what we noticed um, was that there were periods where it started to dip. And, and so one of the examples was when the children were on the um, at circle time and one of the teachers because uh, there were usually two teachers sitting in circle time, but one of them wasn't there. She came in partway through group time and she was in character as Friar Tuck. And she had in her hand uh, a scroll, which was just a piece of paper that she sort of just um, yellowed a bit and burnt the edges of. And she said, this is a letter. I'm Friar Tuck. Actually, she didn't say who she was, but the children were all guessing. And um, she says, oh, I've just come from, the, from Sherwood Forest. And... I've got a message from the dragon. There's a letter from the dragon. And can someone help me read it? So there was one child who was a reader in the group. So this is about tuning into the individuals. So they together read the note and it was the dragon saying it was hungry, it was locked in that, because there's no dragon in that story. But they, this was the character that emerged. Um, and so this problem arose. Well, you should have seen the children. And then this teacher went back out because there were two doors to the room where they were, were doing this and she went back out and then she came back in to the through the other door and she said oh I'm so sorry I, I'm late for group time um I just got caught on the phone with one of the parents and the children said oh Friar Tuck came to visit and of course you know this is the same teacher this is how they get into the imaginary situation so beautifully and, and there's a real problem we've got it and she said what happened and so so they got fired up again and they wanted to help the dragon this time. So this is another example of how you can just introduce a new problem um, to extend the play and deepen it. Um, but also you can do things like have a look at, in their case, they created, a, they decided to, as engineers, they wanted to make a grabby hand machine to grab the treasure out of the castle. So they made models, they did YouTube, they went back in time and talked to the castle engineer and so on. And so it's a matter of, thinking as part of your planning, how do you deepen the play? And so it's about the play problem uh, being solved, which means, of course, the children's play and imagination develops as well. And at the same time, of course, they're learning some really powerful concepts because the concepts then are used in their play. Because they talk about the drawbridge, then when they're using the blocks during child-initiated play, they actually include a drawbridge and they try and work out how the mechanism works and how to bring, you know, how can they make a block come up as part of the drawbridge process. So all of that happens. So it's thinking through when the like you do it in normal planning when you're working with children. You see a little moment where you need to do a bit more planning for their play. And so you, you create a new adventure. Um, or you leave a letter like like um, Friar Tuck, um, leaving the letter from the dragon. 
Sounds, sounds amazing. Um, and I'm sure that as teachers become more experienced in facilitating conceptual play worlds, that they'll get more um, creative and more experience and more ideas as they, as they do it more often. Absolutely. And, and that's why you can take baby steps. Just choose a, like, just reproduce Rosie's walk, for instance. So simple to do. You can do it all in one morning session in the preschool. And then the afternoon, you can have a different adventure um, and just see where it goes. And then, or, you, or there could be a, a letter um, or an email that arrives um, from, from a distant land where they've got different kinds of chickens. And you can start to get into all sorts of other interesting ideas that way too. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marilyn, and thank you everybody for joining us. We'll, we'll close the questions there now because our time is up. And uh, I'll just let everybody know that the information about how to connect with Marilyn, how to join the groups, go, go on the um, course or any of the things, wonderful opportunities that Marilyn has presented is all on our website on the um, on your, your learner dashboard where you found this webinar and tomorrow the recording will be available for you to revisit and you can revisit that anytime our recordings stay there available for you ad infinitum so you can find all the information and revisit as much as you'd like to from there so thank you so much for joining us Marilyn it was wonderful to speak with you and and hear about this exciting conceptual play worlds and I really look forward to um, seeing more of what's what's happening and what other teachers have been doing out there great thanks very much angela for inviting me and um, and and everyone else please tell your colleagues to watch the video 